Today I want to talk to you about the deep soul of a godly mother. The deep soul of a godly mother. My wife and I and, and our family, we had a, a very scary situation back when Bethany was probably about three years old. We were at a, a church. We were having youth choir practice. I believe it was a Saturday night. We we're having youth choir practice. And, and our, our girls, Bethany was three, Kelly was one, and they were always walking around and the youth would you know, pass them off. Even during the service, he'd carry them and pass them off. And so we didn't see Bethany for a while, for a while but it didn't concern us. But uh, after a while, it was the middle of the rehearsal. We hadn't even finished. Uh, somebody said they couldn't find her. And so we started looking. We couldn't find her. We panicked. We, there was a park down the street from our, our church building. And so we looked around outside the building. Uh, my parents lived next door. There was a parsonage. We went over there into the parsonage. To every room went down. Somebody said, maybe she went to the park. So some kids went down to the park. We're looking and we're desperate. Moms, you can just imagine, right? Dads too. That sense of desperation. We could not find her. We had several kids looking. It was a, a good number of, 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 of youth that were helping us to look. And finally, somebody found her. I'm not sure who it was. She was actually hiding in a closet in my parents' house, a parsonage. She had found this closet. And I think it was one of those closets like it's underneath a staircase. So it's not real easily accessible. Uh, Bethany, you just came in. I'm talking about you. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, we were we were mad and happy, mad that she thought it was funny that she was hiding, but so relieved because, you know, you start thinking the worst when something like that like that happens. Well, today I want to talk to you about uh, the story of when um, Jesus got left behind when uh, the family, his family visited Jerusalem uh, and it took them three days to figure out that he wasn't with them. And so let's just read this story. And it's found in Luke chapter two. So if you want to follow along with us in Luke chapter two, this, we're going to read a, a kind of a lengthy passage as we as we set up uh, today's message with the reading of this story. You can also follow along on the YouVersion Bible app if you prefer to do that. Uh, just uh, the Bible app, you can download it. And, uh, and look for our notes under events. And everything is there if you prefer everything in one place. But here it is, Luke 2, beginning with verse 41. It says, Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began uh, looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, he's been missing for a day at this point. Can you imagine the despair? But then we read that after three days, they found him in the temple courts sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Look at that sentence again. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. You know that mothers carry a very special burden for their children. We call it a maternal instinct. Some uh, kids might even say that their mom has a sixth sense. It's just like moms seem to know intuitively when their children are in trouble or when their children are making trouble. They sense when their 
Kids are dealing with a trial, be it an emotional trial, uh, an academic trial, a spiritual trial. I mean, moms just seem to know what we are thinking. Right? It's, it's kind of scary, isn't it? You know, my, my kids growing up, they would ask my wife, how did you know? You know, my wife would point out something that they're doing or going through and usually doing. And uh, they would say, how did you know? And my, my wife would say, God tells me, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, I think so. That must be true. But in this in this scripture passage, we find that Mary, w- with all her maternal instincts, she she's still surprised. She's astonished at what she finds Jesus doing. And I also find it interesting is interesting to see here that it's Mary and not Joseph who is correcting Jesus for, uh, quote unquote, wandering off. And, and that, you know, that may be a good thing. I think moms have a way of disciplining and love that really gets to our hearts. Uh, the tone of her voice, the, the look in her eyes, maybe a hand gesture. I mean, it's all done in love, right? But it can also be very piercing and it's very effective. But almost certainly she was surprised where, uh, where she found Jesus, but almost certainly she wasn't expecting the answer that she got from Jesus when she asked him why. Have you treated us like this? We've been anxiously looking for you. And we understand those words. We understand that anxiety. We've been anxiously looking for you. And she took it personally. Why are you treating us like this? And she certainly wasn't expecting this. I would think she's not expecting. She was not expecting this response. Why were you searching for me? This is verse 49. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house, that I had to be about my father's business. And uh, Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary didn't understand. It might have taken them a while to figure out what was going on with Jesus. I believe eventually they, they understood that he was starting to find his place and to take his place in the father's plan. He needed to be right. He was right where he needed to be uh, right smack in the middle of God's will. And this is why I think that verse 51, if you look at that for a second, verse 51 is significant where it says that he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. She must have spent a lot of time reflecting on her son. You know, I think she, I mean, any mom will spend a lot of time reflecting on their children, especially when they're newborn and as they're growing up in the first day of of daycare or the first day of school and you know they start growing up and you think wow it's you know we're we're we enjoy thinking about them but can you imagine Mary knowing who Jesus was I think she spent a lot of time from the beginning of his birth the beginning of his birth and now here he is, 12 years old these years have passed she's still reflecting when Jesus was born we know the story of how the shepherds went into Bethlehem to see him after an angel appeared to, to them to announce his birth and to tell them where they could find him. Well, they went, they found him where the angel said he would be. They worshipped him. And then they told their story to Mary. And after they left, we read in the same uh, chapter 2 of Luke, verse 19, we read this. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So from that moment, she's treasuring up. She's pondering. He's 12 years old. She's treasuring up. She's pondering in her heart. We know at the end of his life, she was there. She was there at the, at the foot of the cross, pondering with a lot of pain. Uh, it, it had to have been a, a time of, of reflecting and really a life of reflecting, pondering and treasuring everything that she was seeing. And so it was that at this point, now he's 12 years old, she's seen her son begin to step into his role as a one who would die for the sins of the world. And she's reflecting on that. She's pondering that. She's taking that in. She was seeing the human development of her son coupled with a spiritual understanding of who he was. This is huge. This is deep. And she's reflecting on it. She's pondering. She's seeing her son in the middle of the father's will. And I think that this is a great lesson for all parents, all parents, especially for moms, especially for moms. And and here's a point I want to make. 
from this for you moms. The best thing moms can do for their children is to prepare them to discern and follow God's will for their lives. You can prepare them in many other ways. You can prepare them academically as much as you can, and you prepare them, you know, when it comes to the development of their bodies and sports and athletics. But the best thing you can do for your children is to prepare them to discern God's will and to follow it for the rest of their lives. This should be the goal of every parent for their children, that their children would live in God's will. When my wife and I got married, it just so happened, it's kind of a long story I won't get into, but it so happened that I didn't have a job. I had been offered a job as a teacher at Baker Middle School, uh, right out of college. Uh, so this is going to be my first job at Ma- Baker Middle School in Corpus Christi. And uh, and then a series of weird circumstances, that, that job fell through after I had been told all I had to do was sign a contract. And so uh, we thought, you know, do we cancel? This is about April. We were going to get married in August. My wife and I talked that we not cancel, but postpone the wedding. What are we going to do? You know, we're trying to decide. And I spoke to my pastor back in Corpus Christi, and he, he said, well, he says, I don't know. You know, he asked me, how, how adventurous are you? I was like, I'm not. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I don't like adventure. But we, we took the plunge. <laughs> I got the point, you know. I said, okay, so we'll, we'll get married. And I got a job. I think it was three days after our wedding. I got a, a job down there. So, but we, we were undecided, you know, the church here in San Angelo, my dad pastored was praying that I would get a job in San Angelo. And, uh, the church that we were members of in Corpus Christi were praying that, that I would get a job down there. They wanted us down there. My parents, of course, in the church wanted us uh, over here. And so we're praying. And, uh, well, uh, I got the job down there before I got one over there. So we, we went down uh, and started our life together down there and started teaching down there for three years before I ended up moving back. But when that happened, you know, my, my parents were disappointed. They wanted us to be here in the church. But remember, my mom says, you know, she, she said, son, uh, I just want you to be in God's will. I'd love for you to be here, but if, if God wants you there, I want you there because I want you to be in God's will. And I think, uh, parents, you understand that that should be the goal of every parent, to, to live in God's will, not to achieve the highest level of financial success, or to win the most awards, or, or to gain the, the widest recognition. All those things are fine and good. But godly mothers like Mary treasure the realization that their children are right smack in the middle of God's will. Godly mothers like Mary commit their lives to preparing their children to be able to discern God's will and to follow it for the rest of their lives. But how do moms do this? How do moms best prepare their children to discern and follow God's will for their lives? I think that it starts with this. Preparing your children to discern and follow God's will begins, moms, with developing a deep soul yourself. What we read about Mary tells me she had a deep soul. She reflected, she pondered, she treasured things. She didn't always, uh, the, the, I, I think the implication and my inference is she didn't always go around talking about it and telling me, ah, oh, my son, yeah, your son won a race. My son's a son of God. You know, She didn't go out. These are things she treasured in her heart. She, she pondered on them. She reflected them. And, and uh, this, this was part of her deep soul. And so I think for parents, and we're talking to moms here today, that the best way to prepare your children to discern and follow God's will is to develop a deep soul yourself. Because you very, know, very well know that you can't give what you don't have. And it doesn't work. For you to say, do as I say and not as I do. You can't give to your kids the depth, the gravitas that they need if you don't have it yourself. When you travel in an airplane, you know, the flight attendants always explain. They, how many of you ignore the flight attendants when you fly? It's like, yeah, I've heard this before, you know. They always explain that in the case of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, an oxygen mask is going to drop in front of you. 
and, uh, you know, from the compartment above you. And they always say this. They say, please secure your own mask before you assist your children or anybody else traveling with you. The point is that you've got to take care of yourself if you want to be around to help your children or anybody else who might be traveling with you. you got to take care of yourself if you want to be able to, to help your children. If you want your children to develop the spiritual gravitas, the spiritual depth of soul, not to be shallow-minded, but to be a, a young man, a young lady whose desire is to live in the middle of God's will, you want them to have that depth of soul, then you've got to take care of yourself and develop that yourself. Helping them discern and live in God's will is a spiritual act. And so moms, your spiritual life is going to be a foundation for you helping your kids. That's why you've got to prioritize your spiritual life and you've got to determine to develop a a deep soul yourself. Take care of yourself. And then you'll be in a position to help your children where they need it the most, which is in their spiritual walk. And, and as well as other areas, you know, that your, your children, I remember, uh, let me finish my thought. Your children are, are not, you know, unidimensional. Your children are multidimensional. I found, uh, on YouTube, um, it's probably a year or so ago. I found on YouTube a video that this school, Cornerstone, had uh, someone had produced and put out, used it as an ad, and they're talking to teachers. They do they do one of these videos every once in a while. They're talking to teachers and they're talking to students and they're talking to parents. Well, they asked me to say something, so I'm like, oh, there I am. I had a lot of hair. You know, it's it a few years ago. So we've been at this school for a long time, for a long time, and so I was, and, and I and I, you know, I forgot about this video. There it is on YouTube. I'm like, oh, okay. But I and, and the video I'm saying, you know, what I like about Cornerstone is that they teach the whole child. They don't just teach academics. That's hugely important. They don't just, you know, teach athletics and, you know, they teach the spiritual aspect. It's the whole child because our kids are not unidimensional. They're multidimensional. And uh, so when um, when you take care of yourself, you're able to. Uh, help your kids and the most important part I think is the spiritual walk but also the other areas because they are multidimensional people and there's no doubt like I've been saying that Mary had developed this deep soul from the time the angel appeared to her before Jesus was born the time the angel appeared to her to tell her that she would be the mother of Jesus do you remember her response her response was a response that developed, a, 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 that uh, revealed rather a deep soul that knew how to trust in God in the midst of uncertainty, deep uncertainty. I mean, how much more uncertainty can there be when an angel appears to you and said, oh, by the way, you're pregnant. And it wasn't, oh, by the way, it was like that was the main point. You're pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Then you're going to give birth to Jesus, the Messiah. I mean, the, her response, may it be to me, as you have said, her song that he wrote, Luke writes about, uh, you know, he, he, uh, documents this song. We call it the Magnificat. Because it's magnificent. You know, it's this song that she, uh, that she sang or that she spoke. And you look at those words. This is a young lady with a very deep soul. Those words of trust. And as Jesus grew, we, we read that she often pondered and treasured Things in your heart, and you can't ponder and treasure things in your heart without a deep soul. Without a deep soul, you 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 know you minimize things of of spiritual importance. Ah, that's not important. That's not a big deal. So, moms, develop a deep soul for your own good and for the good of your children. Spend more time doing this than worrying about your kids getting ahead in areas that ultimately don't bring fulfillment in Christ. And those things are important. I'm not trying to minimize. Preparing our kids for life. But if you want your children to live in the deep satisfaction of following God's will. Teach them to develop a a deep soul. And that begins with you taking steps to develop a deep soul. Let me answer two questions. Why is this important? And how do we do this? Why Why is it important to develop a deep soul? Three quick things. Number one, because the soul is eternal. The soul is eternal. Everything we might chase after is temporary, but our souls are uh, are eternal. 
If you're teaching your children to go after human recognitions uh, alone, sports trophies alone, fame and fortune, you're leading them down the wrong path. But if you're teaching them to develop a deep soul by following your example, you're laying a foundation for a rich life of deep satisfaction in Christ. Your body will wear down, but your soul will live forever. Why is it important? Number two, because the soul can grow to a limitless capacity. Your soul can grow to a limitless capacity. There's no ceiling when it comes to growing your soul. You and I can never get to the place where we say, well, I'm done with that, man. I'm just so spiritually mature now. I understand all things. No, we can, we never say, we can never say my soul is as deep and as good and as wonderful as it's ever going to be. Do you see how ridiculous that is? Now, there are other areas that I have a limited capacity. The older I get, the more limited my capacity is. You know, I'll, uh, I, I love to run and I love to watch running videos and races and stuff. I'll never be the runner I was, you know, in high school or in my 20s. All my best times when I do the casual, you know, 5K, local 5K races and such. All my best times are in the rearview mirror for me. You know, they're not going to get better. I get better maybe within the Masters. <laughs> That's where I run now, folks. The Masters division. But we have a limited capacity. I'll never be, you know, I'll never be an NBA player as much as I like basketball. I just won't. Uh, even when I was young, that, you know, I was limited. But my soul has no limit. Your kid's soul has no limit. That's why it's important to develop a deep soul. And, and number three, uh, because growing a deep soul is something that's available to everyone. That's what, that's the thing I love the most about pursuing the development of a deep soul. There's not a person created. There's not a person here or watching online today that cannot grow a deep soul. We, like I said, in the previous point, we have limited capacities in, in other areas. There, I'll never do some of the great things that other people are doing in the, in the areas of technology and sports and, or even church life. Even church life. There, you know, I, I look at, um, pastors. I, again, listen to and watch a lot of preaching and I think, man, that was a good sermon. How does he do that? How does he make that point so impactful, you know? And so I may never get there in terms of, you know, ministry, visible ministry. But you know what? I can grow a deep soul. I can, I can grow a soul that has breadth and depth and width to it. And so can you. So can you. And um, when you do that, moms, your kids will notice. When you grow a deep soul, and it'll begin to affect them immediately. So the last point here, how do you develop a deep soul? Well, you know, and I don't wanna I don't wanna say this like and frame it like, oh it's easy. You know, three easy steps to developing a, a deep soul. There are no easy steps. There are no easy steps. But here's how we start. To develop a deep soul, you need unhurried, alone time with God. You've got to have that unhurried, alone time with God. That means unhurried, alone time in prayer, just talking to God. Unhurried, alone time reading the Bible. Unhurried, alone time reflecting, pondering, treasuring, meditating. I say this to you often, but our, our culture, we've lost the ability to reflect. We don't, we never do reflecting. We, we're never quiet enough and sl- we never slow down enough. We're never unheard enough to just reflect on life, reflect on the goodness of God, reflect on the blessings of God. We've got to have something on in the background, the TV going, the music going. We've got to be scrolling, but to put things down and to just meditate, just reflect. That's huge. And to reflect on God's word, to pray and then to pause and hear from God. The, the spiritual maturity and the gravitas that we need in our lives begins with a daily habit of unhurried alone time with God. The daily habit of prayer, Bible reading, reflection. Make the decision to develop your soul. And in fact, here's maybe something you can use as a, as a reminder. As you see 
as you see your children grow physically, let that remind you that you need to keep growing spiritually. You may not grow physically anymore. You, you might be as tall as, you, as you're going to get. Uh, but as let this be a reminder. Let this be a parallel. As you see your kids accomplish a goal. Oh, he, he's learning how to walk. Oh, he's learning how to read. Oh, he's learning this. She's learning this. Every one of those steps, let that be a reminder that, okay, I need to continue to grow spiritually. Because when they're little, you can, you can, you can fix all their problems, right? With a trip to McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, and they're happy. When they become teenagers, Chick-fil-A and McDonald's doesn't fix some of the things your teenagers go through. No, you need a deep soul to, just to, uh, deal with the things that you go through with your teenage children and even into young adulthood. So as they grow a little bit physically, remind yourself, okay, I need to keep developing a, a deep soul. You know, I believe with all my heart that moms already have a head start in developing a deep soul. I think that God has wired them in a way that that helps them develop the, the spirit and the depth of soul that blesses their family. Have you seen that with moms? They're just amazing. Uh, but those natural instincts, mom, are not enough. They're good and we honor you for them today, but they're not enough. You must pursue the development of a deep soul through the spiritual habits that alone can bring the, the depth of soul and elevate your motherhood to a new level, to a new level and help you teach your children to follow God with all their heart. Now here's, here's the thing about a deep soul. What I want to finish with today. A deep soul can get hurt. A deep soul can can be vulnerable. A, an, an uncaring soul doesn't feel pain when their children wander away from God or their, their kids get involved in a, some kind of a painful situation. But a deep soul that a mom has developed and is developing it can it can get hurt. There are uh, some moms today that that are hurting. This is a, a difficult day for some mom. All of you moms here today are in different stages of your lives and of motherhood. Different stages, and and maybe one of those stages is it's painful. Maybe one of those stages you're going through right now is painful. There are uh, this is a hard day for some people. Hard day because they didn't have a mom who cared. And it's a hard day for others because their mom is no longer around. It's a hard day for some moms because their kids, maybe they have a child who is no longer around. It's, a, it's you know, like I said, we're all going through different things, different stages. And so as we honor moms today, we also recall those moms and children, both male and female, for whom this is a difficult day. Your soul has been hurt. Your soul has been bruised. But God sees you. God sees you. You know who else was observing and thinking and pondering when Mary was pondering and observing and thinking and when Mary was hurting, when her son was being crucified? You know who else was watching that was God? God doesn't ponder and reflect the way that we do, right? His His ways are higher than, than ours, Isaiah says, and His thoughts are wiser than ours. So He doesn't respond to things. You know, God knows all things. Nothing catches Him by surprise. Nothing ever dawns on God like it dawns on us, right? Because He knows everything. But He's aware. He's aware of your pain. And if your soul, mom, daughter, son, if your soul has been bruised, has been hurt, I want you to know that God sees you and as you turn to Him, and as we pray for you today, I want you to know that you can reach that point where you say, I'm hurting, but it is well with my soul. I'm in pain, but it is well with my soul. I'm confused. I don't know why I couldn't have a good mom. But it is well with my soul.
That's what I want you to know. And as much as I've hurt, I can still, because God is on my side, I can still grow a deep soul that loves God and that touches God. Would you bow for prayer? Father, we come to you today thanking you for your deep, deep love for us. We really can't fathom the breadth and the depth, the width of your love. But we, we believe, we accept by faith that even when things are not going well, you still love us. And Lord, you gave us the gift of a mom who loves us in a way that models your love. And we thank you. Lord, I thank you for those uh, who... Maybe their, their moms have already gone on to their reward in heaven, but they left behind a legacy. They left behind memories. And so some are thinking about their moms right now. I pray comfort for them, dear Lord. I pray uh, strength for them uh, this day. For those of us who still have our mom, I, I thank you, dear God. I pray that you would guard them and, and just protect them, Father. Grant them joy. Grant them peace. Let the, the remaining, remaining days or, or weeks or months or years of their lives be filled with joy. And God, I pray for those who just didn't have the mom that they needed. They just didn't have the mom that they needed. And, and so they hurt because of that. But God, I know one thing about you among many things is that you fill in the gaps you fill in the gaps that we as human beings leave behind you fill in those gaps and we ask you to do that and God I pray especially for our moms right now I pray that they would just realize how you're calling them just with the maternal instincts you've given them you've, you're calling them to take that to another level and to develop a deep soul for their own sake and for the sake of their children. We trust.